You're listening to WLPNLP Chicago, 105.5 FM, Lumpen Radio, Bridgeport, Chicago. It is, what is today's date? August 23rd, 2018. You're listening to the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable. Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable. I'm your host, Chris Quinn, coming to you once again from the Co-Prosperity Sphere here in Bridgeport, Chicago. Good to be back. It's been, uh, man, three weeks at least, I think, since uh, I've been here at the Co-Pro. I want to thank the Co-Pro and and Lumpen Radio for having us on, and I want to thank the fearless leaders of Lumpen Radio, namely Jamie and, of course, Mr. Logan Bay, and I want to thank producer Surge for getting in here bright and early and getting everything set up for us. So thank you so much to Surge as well. I also want to thank my guest hosts who uh, did the last couple shows. That's what um, I was going to ask. Did they do a best of? Or? Uh, yep, yep. We do. Uh, we did uh, a bunch. So what we did was I, I, pre, I, I pre-taped some stuff where it was a bunch of us sitting around and being like, uh, it was some premise where we were all like locked in here overnight one time and we couldn't get out. <laughs> and we were just like, remember that time when? And then we would just cut to like 40 minutes of a previous show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, um, so, yeah, that's kind of what we did. We kind of, you know, phoned in a clip episode like they used to like back in the day. Right. You know, um, totally did that. No, we had uh, uh, Andrew Gill and an unnamed guest who was kind of an anonymous host. Uh, I haven't listened to the show, to tell you the truth, because uh, uh, Jamie and, uh, has not sent me the archives yet, so they haven't gone out. So this will pro- probably <laughs> go out before the ones that were recorded, but I was out of town, so that's my excuse. Um, you were I, spreading the dust-based economy to Europe, right? That's tr- Oh, yeah. I forgot the dust. <laughs> I am I'll the dust. worst. Yeah. I'm never I, coming back. I found some dust. I found some Euro dust, <laughs> and I traded... That could mean a lot of things. Dust for dust. <laughs> I traded dust for dust, literally. Yeah. Um, Welcome to the I economy. St- I start, yeah. I mean, I brought the dust-based economy to <laughs> Holland. Great. It's it's very true. There's a dust brewing out there. And me, like a psycho, saw them at a booth in a beer festival <laughs> and raced over to them, got all the kind of like swag and stickers and everything I can could ask them if they'd ever had zombie dust uh they were like no we haven't i happen to have a couple <laughs> so bottles with me because i always ISO. do i always do. always do so i had a trench coat on and i opened it up and was like what you looking for two weeks three weeks what you what you want vintage yeah vintage um uh, and we traded some du- and i traded dust for dust i was iso <laughs> dust and i four trade dust just as God, you predicted hand. yeah you were you're kind of like the uh who's the who's the old monetary and uh, financial policy dude from uh, in, in olden times in the U.S. You're, you're him, basically, Mike. <laughs> him. Yeah, great. Um, uh, sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Greenspan? Is that what we're doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah him. Old, olden times. <laughs> olden <laughs> times. <laughs> Alan Greenspan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, somebody's out there. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, I want to, um, yeah, uh, thank everyone for, for out there who's listening on 105.5 FM on the on the airwaves or on the Lumpin' Radio app if you've got uh, iOS or a web browser or anything like that or TuneIn Radio, that works as well. If you are listening live, you should hop in and you're not like driving, you should hop into the chat room. Don't chat while you're driving. Um, that's located at tlk.io slash WLPN. And uh, chat away. Tell us what we've got wrong. Tell us, you know, that I'm an tell me that I'm an idiot because I obviously don't you know that that's um, you know 
who is that guy? Ugh, I forget. Me? Yeah, mm-hmm. you. Um, you like idea, Adam isn't? Smith or something like that. But, <laughs> um, dust of Nations? Yeah, Dust of yeah. Nations. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I also want to thank those of you who are listening via the podcast. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and for anyone who's listening, however however you guys do it, probably podcast, probably on iTunes. I still think that's, that's the number one. Um, for those listening for the first time, uh, there's a little spiel. I say at the top of every show, and uh, this is that spiel. Uh, the goal of the show is to open up a window into how the people making, selling, marketing, and facilitating the beer getting into your glass feel about the topics that are part of their everyday lives. Many of my greatest beer experiences have been talking about beer while sharing beers with people whose opinions I respect and admire, and it's these experiences that I try to capture with this show, the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable, and I'm going to get to my guests right now, but first I have to mention that the opinions of my guests are uh, just that, the opinions of my guests. It's it's not the opinions of any other entity that they may be affiliated with. Um, it's just their own. It's not the opinion of, uh, you know, for example, Lumpin' Radio um, or even the Beer Temple. It's just their own. Uh, so let's get to it. The way we introduce um, guests is by order of seniority, that being how many times they've been on the show. And, uh, man, I think you've probably co-hosted as many times as anyone else has been on the show, Mr. <laughs> Shul- right. Mr. You've done Shul- three. Out. You've done three shows, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> anyone else has been guests on the show, I'm saying. So I think it's 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 an easy week to, to pick the order, at least who goes first. Um, um, you know, Mr. Dust himself. <laughs> Uh, Half of the, the Mr. Dustin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, still, you know, still, you're both brothers. You're both Mr. Yeah. Dust. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Dust is my dad. You know that? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, I'm Dusty. <laughs> uh, uh, what's up, Mike? How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Uh, what's new? Anything? Saw uh, you yesterday for a hot minute. Yeah. Yeah, I was having a very important business meeting with our business associates at Dark Matter. Uh, yeah, <laughs> which always end up seem to happen at your bar. Yeah, your uh, someone was uh, just pounding uh, Pappy Twenty Three. I think that is you a know, very Jesse Diaz do. move. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, what's what's that one? Yeah, let's get that one. How much is that? Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was nice, and mm-hmm. then he went on a. Uh, I mean. <laughs> I, I love Jesse, and I agreed with what he was saying, but I think it was fair to call what he did a rant, right? Oh, yeah, it was definitely a rant. It was a rant. It uh-huh. was like a standing in the middle of the bar, elevated, like like a shout. Well, it, it was a shout. <laughs> um, I think that's normal volume for him, but... Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it's specifically a rant because he was like already in the process of leaving and then stopped and kind of planted in the middle of your yeah. bar and started his whole spiel and then customers came in and saw it and to. just walked right back yep. out and we just, just left an older <laughs> couple uh came in and stood like got like four feet inside the bar and this like stood this there is trash. i tried to make it look like they weren't like so like they they went into the vestibule they picked up like a like one of the mash tons <laughs> yeah. or something set it down walked like right out. back out no tvs <laughs> so you yeah. can, it's fair to say that that's what beer temple is like every day it's just to some some someone prosthetic advertising about yeah <laughs> while, while drinking pappy 23 <laughs> yeah you know these yep. these limousine beer geeks <laughs> right. in there you know right. um but uh yeah that was that was fun yeah. um you were there for uh well what was the rant what was the topic uh i feel like that's, that's, his, that's his business that's his cross <laughs> <to> bear <laughs> yeah uh, um have him on the show yeah and in fact <laughs> i specifically i did specifically say Obviously, nothing you say here is on the record. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so if I did, then good try. Yeah. USOB. <laughs> but uh, I, I did specifically say that. I have accidentally got myself in, in a little bit of of trouble almost in the past where not <laughs> stuff that someone was telling me at the bar, but like someone was telling me in just when we were just like talking and then I've – yeah, you can't be mentioned just, you can't it. Be just quoted them they can't on be air, saying this is definitely their opinion. And no, I didn't they attribute me to it. Tell everyone. I didn't attribute it to them, but I talked about what we were talking about and like, and you know, I've I heard that this and that, and 
you know, the person was listening was like, hey, that's well, I, was, if I'd known what we were going to do, I wouldn't have I, I would have clarified. And I felt terrible. Oh, this was like right when we were first starting the show. Who was that? So the the issue <laughs> was, yeah. Um, so I see how it's going to be. Anyway, nothing's new with you. Any new dust related news? Uh, nothing. Particularly nothing exciting dust related, related that you're hoping to do or. OK, cool. Oh, oh, no. uh, <laughs> we were planning something, but. We could not get two out of three Floyds to support our uh, our, our idea. Hmm. I, don't, I think okay. you need all three of them until I didn't want Nick Floyd to beat me up. The the uh, tribunal. Yeah. The tribunal of Floyds. Yeah, we were gonna do an all zombie dust pop up bar at Emporium, but just yeah. like twelve lines of dust of varying ages. <laughs> How long was the uh, the pop up gonna last? Like well, a couple months or something? One, yeah. Uh, like I think it was gonna be permanent. Actually. A permanent <laughs> permanent pop up. up. Yeah. A permanent dust pop up. Yep. yep. And you were just doing that to funnel your own dust need, I yeah, assume. Right. Yeah, it was, it, it, it was a, just a it was a front. It's all a big gambit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. I got it. Yeah. Um Well, thanks for coming on. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for again being right on time and you nailed I would, it. I would like to publicly disparage Google Maps for lying to me. They said it would take me fifty minutes to get down here and it took an hour and forty minutes. So Whoa. From the north side? Okay. Uh yeah, but right by where you're uh your new spot is actually. It's oh. like a block away from my apartment. Cool. Yeah. Well, let's keep Only the ball rolling. Only took me 56 minutes from the brewery. You're the first one's here. You're the first person here, Mr. That's John right. Barley of uh, Salmo. To be fair, I've never been late before. I've been on a lot of these. You're not technically <laughs> late. Uh, Jason Klein has set that bar several times <laughs> live as like he interview uh, intros have already started. He sits down and he's like, not technically late. I'm not technically late. <laughs> I'm keeping my streak alive, Ripken style. Yeah, exactly. No, <laughs> I mean, hey, yeah. you got to win some by technicality. <laughs> right. That's you know? my favorite way to win. Yeah. Um, by forfeit or by technicality. Mm-hmm. So, um, all right. Somebody didn't want to have anything to do with it. Shut that door. Didn't want to hear <laughs> us. Uh, but anyway, uh, John Barley, been a while. How are you? Doing well. What's new with you? Um... Not a, not a lot and a lot. This is on the record, by the way. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, just keeping busy. I mean, we're we're hustling nonstop. So she haven't been on in a year, and nothing's new. There's nothing new with you. Yeah, not a whole lot. Okay. No, cool. no, That's no. Fine. Yeah, no. We're. Uh, yeah, I mean, Samuels keeps trucking along, and and uh, I just had a little girl too. So oh. That's been about ten months. <laughs> nothing new. So I'm thrown off. Yeah, but okay. uh, yeah, other than that. Cool. Yeah, you got married since you've been on last, I think, right? Didn't no, you? no, that was a couple years before. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And she's huh. been here as a shadow guest as well, I think, sitting behind. Yeah. At one point. Uh-huh. But, uh, yeah, yeah, just traveling a ton lately, particularly. Mm-hmm. And, and, and some stuff in the news about you you getting a, a, a tap room open, a second location, right? Yeah, yeah. We still have some work to do, but, yeah, we're, uh, we're working. I, I like to say we're actively working on our – Logan Square location, but uh, we're uh, we've got uh, community hearing and and uh, zoning hearing coming up next couple of weeks. So that's going to be the new Malt Row. Yeah, yeah. You know, I yeah. mean, let alone you know the fact that uh, you know Metro moved from Malt Row, who was they were one of the anchors there. Right, right. Now they're well, they're in Avondale, but then you've got you know Maplewood and Bishi, which I just went to, and mm-hmm. uh, Pipeworks is going to get in. On that, yeah. and uh, you've got Rev, who is the true anchor. Middle Brow's right over Middle there. Middle Brow's opening yep. up. And, uh, and then my apartment's right over there, so you guys come sure. hang out, everyone listening. That's right. opening up. <laughs> yeah, nice. That's opening, yeah. Yeah, That's opening up. It's an above-ground, underground kind of thing. It's a second Where floor. everybody goes after bar time, Food right? Time, <laughs> time. Well, yeah. well, Chris and I tend to end up there after these things, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, drinking sober juice. Yeah, drinking sober. <laughs> yeah. What are you trying Off to the say? record. What are you saying? <laughs> what are you trying to imply? <laughs> just how it sounded to your I, ears i said what i said yeah um let's keep rolling mr brian kirby uh present what, what's up you haven't been on in a while i have not yeah uh, by choice and by uh default i suppose <laughs> what, the, what the f he's telling me how he doesn't like you anymore well and, I mean, what am i gonna come on here every three months and say the same old same old so hopefully i have something new to say today I take that as a personal affront. Right. He's been thinking <laughs> of... Uh, no, honestly, <laughs> like, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays are an off day for me. I have to get home by 6 o'clock to relieve the babysitter because my wife works late those days. So just by default, it's tough for me to get out here. So what's new, man? So, Brian, for <laughs> those of you who uh, uh, may not have listened, uh, you know, long ago or, or don't quite remember, 
he's uh, just a meat and potatoes kind of guy, and he um, owns Heartland uh, Distribution. Heartland for, Distribution. Heart, well, it's yeah, it's a distribution company. We call it Heartland Beverage. Heartland Beverage, which okay. you still have never gotten right, which is fine though. And now it's just like it's fun. You still have never gotten right. Yeah. All right, that's fine. <laughs> I like to let it. So what I like to do is like let it. Uh, build up right so then there, as yeah. I start needling back people aren't like why is he being such a jerk Ryan is li- literally wearing a shirt <laughs> I just didn't want it to be like about distribution it. it's not about distribution it's about the beverages sitting directly right. across in yeah. full view of Chris who is also a customer yes <laughs> it's it's ostensibly you probably see an invoice every once in a while with the company name on it only when things go south <laughs> right um, or, that's with when I'm paying them they usually just yeah. go right into the shredder <laughs> and Sue me for it. The ILCC is going to come after you guys. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Um, (laughs) So, hey. Yes. So, hey. Um, So, nothing's new for you either. No, I didn't say that. Oh. Um, (laughs) We have a lot going on. It seems like, you know, we put our hands in a lot of uh, different baskets just trying to look at, you know, opportunities that are out there. And, like, a lot of times nothing happens at all. And then it seems like it all comes together at the same time as it is right now. Um, So, we've just started kind of... um, Jumping in the foray of NAs, which is non-alcoholic um, beverages, and then uh, we're going to start our first spirits brand in a month or oh, two, cool. which is pretty cool. Yeah, we're excited for that. Um, but we're still, you know, looking at Illinois breweries, still looking at you know Midwest regional breweries, and um, just really um, trying to solidify our portfolio even more and bring things to uh, consumers, you know, um, that we think that they would enj- would enjoy. So. Um, We've experienced good growth. You know, we're still jamming, still doing the same old, you know, ethos is still the same. Um, had added some drivers, added some trucks, added some sales reps, uh, but still, you know, kind of doing doing our same old thing. But I'd imagine in a month or two I should be able to come back and then actually have some real news for you guys. But things right. are turning right now, um, you know, oh. which is fun. So a year is not enough. I give you 13 months, and then they'll have something <laughs> new. No. I'm, I'm still happy doing what I do, and I'm still happy to come that's here and awesome. talk about issues. That I appreciate us, it. So I appreciate it. That's Thanks for coming on. Thanks. And it, and it seems like uh, yeah, you were and you you gave me a heads up. Uh, it was last summer. You're like, hey man, I'm out for the summer. I'm yeah. going to be super busy. So in a way, it's good that it kind of extended, and you've been busy for a long time. So good to have you back on. I I enjoy having you. Um, you can make fun of me all you want. I'm just going to tell you how I genuinely, genuinely feel about you, which is that I appreciate when you spend time with me and tell me how you feel. So thank you very much. <laughs> um, if you want to make okay. any sort of like pointed jokes about me and Mike's relationship and what we do late at night together, feel free. I, I don't sign off on this. I'm just going <laughs> to, I'm just going to cut that clip out where you say, I appreciate you. And then I'm just going to take that to account and be like, Hey, this is Chris Quinn of the beer temple. It says he appreciates me. So yeah. How new, much do you want to buy? It's a new ringtone. Yeah. yeah. Um, my uh, final guest is, uh, I think this is your first full-time guest appearance, right? You were on for, we, you were you were just on for like a segment in the past, and then you were in the peanut gallery and kind of a little bit Zach, but Mr. Zach Rotello of uh, the Olympic Tavern. Um, yeah, from the, from the peanut gallery. Howdy. From the peanut gallery. Uh, no, that's when you were here. You were here when Aaron was on. But you yeah, weren't. I snuck in. I snuck in with Aaron. I yeah. figured, you know, yeah. might as well, might as well hop on his coattails and come in and get some beer and hang out with you guys for a day. Cool. Um, well, uh, the reason I'm saying, I think, if this is your first official time as a guest, then you have to introduce yourself because that's the rule. First time guests yeah. introduce themselves. So why don't you tell everyone who you are and and what you uh, do uh, in the in the beer world. Or yeah, the beverage yeah. world um, in uh, Brian's I, th- I think technically I did this last time because I was on with Barley when we were talking about growlers a million years ago. Oh, but, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll do a quick recap. My name is Zach. Um, I work at a hey, bar Zach. and restaurant. And He's Rock gotten over the Illinois. growler thing. That's a good – just so everyone knows. <laughs> Gave up. Yeah. Yeah, I work at a bar and restaurant in, uh, in Rockford, Illinois. We've been doing good beer for, I don't know, almost Where? 20 years now. And uh, you got to make your own fun. So we do. Well, I appreciate you uh, – coming on as well and uh i kind of liked it when you were in that spooky dark room but you turned on the lights and it's just a room but it, it was yeah. much more mysterious <laughs> before yeah. Um, yeah it's not as cool so uh um 
So, uh, let's, visual gags let's on an get... audio medium. Yeah, exactly. Oh, there you go. I'm like doing next month's schedule and like playing Fortnite while I'm talking to you guys. So as long as you as long as you touch your it. mic a lot, it's all good. Um, so so I uh, let's move. So a regular segment we do is we talk about beers that we've had lately or are excited to try or that were just interesting to us. Um, so we'll we'll go around. I'm gonna start um, because it's one of the more memorable beers I've had, um, you know, for whatever reason, is the Sweetwater 420 Strain G13 IPA. Has anyone else had that this beer yet? No. No. Oh, You yes. were there yesterday. Yeah, I think I had a sip of it. <laughs> Did it bring you back to Great Taste of the Midwest like three years ago when you came to walking on some railroad tracks after um, consuming a... There's a train by there? ...dessert from a certain brewery. <laughs> yeah. That somebody handed me and asked me if I wanted to eat something. I was like, sure. Um, Is that the standard answer? And then literally, yeah, like kind of came to in the middle of a field with with train tracks. Yeah. So no one really knows what that train is going to or from. No one can. But anyway, this beer, this beer. Let's let's get. Let's get. This could go bad. So let's get. Let's get. uh, Let's get back on track. it's one of those like hemp beers or or, or marijuana beers ah. that is brewed with I think terpenes. Yeah. Um, I really don't know much about the process, but there was uh, one from oh boy Lagunitas or somebody put one out, and then the big one then was the the Hemperer. I mean, they've been making hemp beers for a long right. time, but the Hemperer was the first one. You're like, whoa! I was anyway. Like this actually smells kind of like the real deal. And then this beer, somebody just put in front of me and said oh have you tried the new Sweetwater 420 variant or something like that and I was like no um and I just started laughing when I smelled it because it's it's stupid (laughs) how much this thing smells like marijuana it's ridiculous not burning marijuana like someone just like dumped a whole pile into a room and it's crazy uh and I will say it was definitely the most talked about beer uh, last night at the bar when I was like kind of working behind the bar for the first time in a while. People were um, who had had it before, uh, at, like a couple of days ago at the bar, wanted to get it again. We're getting their friends to try it and stuff like that. It was interesting. Not a bad beer either. I mean, would you actually, say they were high on it? Yeah, they were high on it. Okay. They were riding the green dragon, is what I would say. <laughs> That's actually what you would say. But um, yeah, they were riding the green dragon. And <laughs> Never skipped a beat. Is that what you're? Is, yeah, it's in the, it's in the repertoire. Yeah. Yes. Um. So. Yeah, that was great. What did you think of it, Mike? I mean, if you just smelled it or had a taste of it, anything I, or just uh, like eh, eh. it, it was it was cool. Uh, those, I'm not the, saying it's necessarily cool or not. Uh, yeah. It was it was interesting. I mean, the terpenes that are the same terpenes that are in uh, hops, so like the same flavor components end up in a lot of same aromatic qualities that you smell in weed anyway. So mm-hmm. they're just using the actual isolated flavor component. But you can just go online and buy. Right. Like they've had them, those isolated for a long time, but people are now becoming like aware of it. Yeah. So you can... That makes sense to people. That like, what, if you were to make a terpene beer five years ago, it would be kind of irrelevant. Are there other isolated terpenes that exist that people could kind of do this with? And well, there's a lot of terpenes. Like the so, what makes each hop unique is the makeup of its terpenes, at least aromatically and flavor wise. Mm-hmm. So uh, you can get a breakdown of the terpenes from your hop supplier, and you can probably just go and find those online at some clandestine dark web thing I use. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're actually doing something similar soon. So we have a friend in uh, in New York who is a distiller who has like a rotor rotary evaporator. Mm-hmm. So he takes like spent hop tube and then rotary evaporates it to get the essential like the oils out of it. So it's not pure terpenes; they're usually blends of stuff, and it's not specific singular ones. It's actually what was in the hop itself. 
so we're going to be making an IPA with with him. It's called Arcane in New York, and That's using awesome. these as like the aromatic quality of it. Nice, so, yeah. That's super well, interesting. Keep yeah, it yeah, keep cool. it rolling. Anything else that you are excited that you've had that you're excited about or wanted? Uh, to well, you know I'm a Green Bottle boy, so I'm a big fan. Uh, <laughs> I had the Colonel Toby at your bar last night. Mm-hmm. It was delicious. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was at a Jester King beer. Yeah, yeah. Jester King, and then the, a collaborator who was the was it Colonel? The Colonel? Yeah. yeah. Like three point four percent, like uh, session, whatever. I don't know what you call it, table beer. I guess uh, it was delicious. And then I was in uh, Detroit or at Ferndale, technically, a couple weekends ago at the uh, Bee Nectar Palooza. I got to try some of the Garden Path fermentation stuff, which is the new Ron extract and Amber, uh, his partner's project. Yeah. And so they captured all the yeast they're using was captured in the Pacific Northwest. I was talking to them about it, and they have they, their first beer they put out was based on like the Duranc XX bitter. They want to make something like that. Um, and they were, awesome they yeah. captured, people think that if you capture, use wild yeast, you're basically using bread. That's like actually almost the opposite of the case. So they, everything they captured was pretty much all sac, uh, all saccharomyces. So it was like not funky. It was just kind of clean, straightforward. It was like this beautiful nose. It's like really like honey tones to it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So they're going to be doing a lot of stuff like that. So I'm interested to see what they do. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Brian, anything you, you, uh, Want any beers you want to talk about, or you just want to talk about how Mike no. just talked about capturing We're good. sack? Let's keep going. <coughs> okay. Um, all right. I'll so you've had no beers well. that you've enjoyed. Well, I've lately. had beer, but nothing worth. I mean, they're good, but. All right. We're already thirty minutes. <laughs> maybe let's, I let's guess. Let's go. Let's get to the meat and potatoes. Okay. All right. According to. All right. I mean, I would think. <laughs> Don't maybe you represent? Like yeah, that's fine. No, of going on. Uh, John, anything that you've been you've had lately that was exciting, or something that's coming out that you're excited to try? Um, I've been traveling a bit lately. Last week I was over in uh, Seattle for most of the week. We were brewing with the Holy Mountain crew. Oh, and, cool. And they had a, uh, like a Tetanang focused Hellas. That was pretty cool. Awesome. Yeah. So we were crushing a lot of that. Nice. Um, yeah, seems to definitely those, uh, kind of true to style, but almost like, uh, as you would have them, uh, like super fresh in, yeah. in Germany, like with the noble hop character. Um, yep. So was it like so? If it's a Hellas, so I'm guessing it was pretty. You know, the hops were pretty much in in check, not kind of like a. Yeah, they. I mean, for their clean beers, they do pretty true to style. Yeah, straightforward, super fresh. Not like an IPL called a Hellas no. or <laughs> dry like, hop. Like type. Trillium has a Kolsch that's like hazy, right? And, right. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> and you know, loaded with hops. Good beer, but sure. Yeah, uh, Zach, how about you? I just had a uh, second shift, a uh, little big hop with dinner tonight, and that was actually really nice. I enjoyed that, but I am currently uh, trying this new Pipeworks premium Pilsner. Oh yeah, and it tastes—it's very premium. Yes, I'm, I'm happy with the quantity of premium in the in the can. We tried to put as much premium in as we possibly could. <laughs> Way to talk up the guest, Zach. Without being irresponsible. Kudos. I'm not. Oh, I'm not. That's go. just what was at hand. That was. That's what was at hand. Thank as you, it, sir. As it should Thank you for your be. support, as always. <laughs> You didn't awesome. even say a single beer. <laughs> <laughs> I knew he had my back. Um, well, uh, the Taskmaster has noted that it's half hour. That's about time for us to take uh, a station break and let people know uh, some of the other stuff that is going on on Lumpin' Radio, some of the other cool programming. Uh, and then we'll be back, and we're going to talk about some uh, – some new legislation, you know, stuff. So, so stay tuned. That's what you call a teaser to uh, <laughs> <laughs> to get everyone to run away. We'll see you guys very soon. <laughs> Welcome back to the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable. I am Chris Quinn, and I am joined by the Green Dragon himself of Heartland <laughs> Distribution LLC. Nailed it. And Beverage. Mike Shalal. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Shalal, I'm changing John the name of the Barley, <laughs> and Zach Ritello. Um and of course uh, producer Serge. Um, so there was uh, back in, on uh, way back in Ep 127, we talked about some legislation that had been proposed um, by the Guild and uh, the executive director of the Guild. Pardon, pardon me, uh, Danielle. Del Sandro, I think it is how you pronounce her name, came on, literally came right up from Springfield, and, uh, what, you okay? <laughs> okay. Um, and, 
<laughs> Brian is like has lost it. He's just cracking up. She came up. Uh, Danielle came right up from Springfield and uh, from talking about it. And we uh, from I guess uh, I don't know what you were arguing for for the the legislation. And we L- lobbying, about lobbying, lobbying. Mm-hmm. lobbying. There you go. Much better term. Much more accurate <laughs> term. More expensive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, we talked quite a bit about it, and lo and behold, that uh, legislation has passed now, and uh, it's you know caused definitely a lot of conversation here in the beer world in Chicago, and there was I, I think it qualifies as an epic post <laughs> on uh, Facebook that Josh, a uh, friend of the show, Josh Noel, uh, posted. Uh, when he does he have a book out, he does have a book out now. <laughs> um, that was actually when she was on was the first time that 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 gag started. I don't know what you're talking about. Yes. about gags. I yeah. do gags. Um, uh, uh, man, there was just this really upset look on, like almost disappointed look on Brian's face, and you said that. <laughs> anyway, um, had a good gag joke. So, <laughs> um, but anyway, it's passed, and uh, it it has caused a lot of of stir. Um, so it, it, there's two parts to it. Um, well, there's uh, maybe more, but I think that the, the thrust of it is, and, and let me know if thrust. if I get it right. Um, family show, guys. Yeah. <laughs> it's a family I love, show. Would you say meat and potatoes? <laughs> no, no. It's like I like when I, I just like literally lob something in the air and then – John, hit John like hits like a ball yeah. John hits like a stretch double and it's like, eh, eh. Uh, nailed it, nailed it. <laughs> um, so, um, but anyway, the the two sides of it or that we were talking about when she was on was one that breweries with more than one location can now transfer between the locations mm-hmm. without having to go through distribution. And John, I mean, I'm, I'm a, as you're a former president of of the guild, yeah. So I know you're not not anymore, but uh, I'm relying on you to have a little bit of idea of what right. these yeah, laws the ability, are. Yeah, ability to transfer. Yep. Yeah. Um, and the other side of it is that these that production facilities with tap rooms can also buy through distribution beer and cider asterisks on that but um mm-hmm. uh right are those the two main sides of it? Is there anything else that i was missing? yeah there's t- i mean there's tiers so we can uh, uh class right. one breweries can transfer within class one class one can i think now transfer to class two there's uh, those are production limits that quantify a class, right right yeah yeah production so. limits and then you get certain rights like if you're a uh, uh i believe if you're class one you um, have the ability to transfer within commonly owned breweries, but you give up your right to self-distribute anywhere in the state. Um, so there are some limits there as well. In a class one. Right. Yeah. Which is the, the big, the biggest ones, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which is over 120,000 barrels. It's, it's up to, isn't it? Up to. Oh, up to. Yep. Okay. So, I mean, pretty high, pretty high limits. So. You, yeah, you can't really self-distribute if you're at 120 anyway. Right. So, yeah. Um, and the limit that you are allowed to self-distribute even under that is – what's the self-distro but limit? It's still the same. You do 7,500 yeah, up 7, to 15,000. Yeah. Just to give so some 30. people some context, like 7,500 versus 120, you're right. not going to be doing that anyway, as, as you just said, but to put some you numbers behind be, it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the way that they were um, lobbied, I guess, or, or talked about was – it, it allows, um, like, a brew pub and a production facility, um, you know, like, let's use, I, I think I used Rev at the time. So if Rev Brew Pub wants to put on Antihero, its flagship, at the brew pub, that beer is now produced at, you know, their production facility up the street, mm-hmm. um, they would have to have a distributor um a beverage uh, LLC company pick up their beer and take it to their warehouse it would have to touch the floor of the warehouse is the term that they use and then it could get on dock bump yeah dock bump and then go to another 
then then it could go to the brew pub. So it would have to be picked up, take to a faci- right. taken to a facility, and back. And and, and they some- would have to buy it at normal sale value for what they would sell it to any other bar. Correct? Yeah, there couldn't you, you be can't, a special you can't cut discount. a deal. That's, yeah, right. Um, and it sounds like in the past there had been kind of like a a wink, wink, like a, a maybe an invoice had been cut, but they just transferred it. But I think they had kind of like um, really blocked that down a little bit more. Yeah. And now you might have had two facilities that were a couple miles apart that now had to go, you know, 15 miles away and 15 miles back and all this sort of stuff. So that was why how the the one side of it was pitched is as transferring between the two. And then the other was that um, collaboration beers, uh, beers that, that breweries collaborated on, um, were, would not be, but with another brewery, obviously, would not be able to be poured at their tap rooms. Um, but now, because they didn't make it themselves right. and only beers that they made themselves, they could serve. But now... They can serve those beers uh, as long as it goes through the normal distribution channels, right? So you, I made a collaboration. Pipeworks did a collaboration with uh, – who's the guys with the distiller? Uh, Arcane. Arcane. As an example, I'm not saying uh, out of state. Um, you know, obviously they couldn't serve just Arcane beer, but now they could because – or because, you know, it's a collaboration. You guys are – excited about this thing and yeah yeah well they're actually the stiller so we still can't buy their stuff okay but pretend they're not <laughs> yeah right I, the, yeah. the point stands yes so it seems pretty simple those things all seem fair so why were there 300 comments on this facebook post almost all of them by industry people kind of going back and forth um, Michael Roper, like there was a statement from him on, on episode 127 about why he didn't feel it was good, but I just wanted to kind of open it up from here. Um, Zach, I kind of gave the, the pitch that the, uh, the guild gave when, you know, kind of talking about it here. Um, why, what's wrong with, cause you kind of said that you weren't happy with some of the stuff. So I wanted to. Or you had some uh, issues with it. I don't want to put words. I, I don't know that I wasn't happy with it. I, you know, I think for the most part, most retailers have been pretty supportive of most of the people in the brewing channels. And you know, when when it was suggested that they be able to self distribute and all this stuff, we said, you know, that's that's great. And I think when when they said, hey, we're gonna open tap rooms and be able to serve some beer after our a tour, which is a pretty common sense thing. I think most people have been pretty supportive of those things. Um, I think where it's becoming different is where one set of licenses is required to do certain things to achieve a certain means that another isn't. Um, Can you be, spe- so you're talking about a, a bar and, versus and I don't, a yeah, And I don't want to speak for anyone else on that thread. I think, I think there's a lot of, a lot of topics that come up in that thread as far as, you know, tap rooms obviously becoming uh, an increased, you know, competition for your neighborhood bar and restaurant or, or bottle shop or retailer. Um, that, that was wrapped up in there. Um, and Obviously, Roper, a lot of liquor yeah. law is unclear. I think some of that became out of that the wine versus cider conversation because, I don't know, you and I are both retailers, and do, do you know the difference in wine versus cider? Obviously, there's something about 7%. So, I think that may be from a tax standpoint, though, right? Yeah. So uh, I went back and listened, and Danielle said that cider is – classified as a wine the mm-hmm. only time it's specifically called out is for taxation that the fact that they use the word cider uh you mm-hmm. know means that they're not necessarily going for wine but legally um you know there it may be and and maybe this is a gray area that cider and wines are uh, synonymous they they kind of mean the same thing it's a well, it's, it's possible, a fermented fruit it's beverage. possible they mean the same thing in production means but they might not mean the same thing for distribution means mm-hmm. so there might be that they get taxed the same way because they're using fruit as the the source of uh sugar to ferment their alcohol but they might be and i, I do not know this but they might be categorized differently when they are distributed because of the alcohol content yeah we, pay, we pay we pay different rate rates to uh, based upon the alcohol percentage of whatever it is that we're selling, so, sure. So, so we sell a certain percentage in the, within the state of Illinois. It's point two three one uh, cents per gallon 
below seven percent. So every, that's why a lot of things are built yeah. to six point nine. Right. So, but we have exactly three more. There's said, three more a, levels above that. But there's it's a taxation more more issue. Expensive. Well, it's, on that, on that, on beer, that yes, beer as well. On that topic. Yeah. No. Um, no, just wine. No, any any beer any well any beer that's below seven percent we're beverage. at that level. But anything else that gets above that we get taxed at a higher level. Beer so too. Essentially, on a beer, yeah. If like a, 40, a 10% 40, 14, ten percent beer, yeah, we should be paying higher taxes. Okay. Now it depends on the brewery. If the brewery, I was unaware of that. If the brewery's reporting the same thing that we are, the state's never going to know because why, why? Why would they know what X Y Z barrel aged beer actually sure. is? But, but yeah, honestly, it's essentially you know if you're selling an 11, 14 percent spirit, it should be taxed at that higher rate. Hmm. Mm. Um. So oh, you know, continue, uh, Zach. Anything else? I mean, yeah, you were just kind of saying that there were. Well, just talk different, about what you your, your your parts of uh, what what you were discussing. Then you don't have to talk uh, for anyone else. Uh, yeah. So I yeah like like I said, there's a lot of layers to that. Um, I think that there has been a feeling among a lot of retailers that at least I've talked to that said there's just not a lot of reciprocity back and forth from the guild, and seeing that they are opening what amounts to as another bar under a different license with a lot of the same liberal you know. Uh, abilities under that is just seems to be rubbing a lot of people the wrong way um and i think some of that stems out of the ideas that when tap rooms were proposed it was somewhere to stop for a beer after a tour not as an all-night consumption place that was this part of the third tier system that unfortunately we have to work through in the united states i'm not the biggest fan of the three tier but i've you know grown up running a business under it and i just have to work within the framework of what it is. And I think some of the kickback to the other perspective on that thread of someone saying, you know, I think um, Mike Roper was complaining, you know, and saying, hey, we, you know, our, our numbers are down this year. And, and I can only point to these certain reasons why is that there's a lot more outlets for beer in my neighborhood. And, you know, tell him, to, uh, rooms, yeah. telling him that he has to open a brewery then instead to, to stay busy, I thought was a little... A little much. So we don't yeah, have to go I think to the, the tone was a little there. off. I think yeah. say those comments not speak for so. most people in the on the producing oh, yeah. side of that. That was a, yeah, a yeah. as a rogue actor. I was <laughs> would not yeah, stand right. behind that at all. That's um, a very rude thing. Yeah, I don't think that was an official stance. That was just right. one person's opinion. But um, yeah. But anyway, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think talking to retailers, and I'm so it's funny. I'm in a weird position. I am a retailer, but I don't want to. But I want to try to collect. Everything I've heard people talk about, I can't have every single retailer that I talk to on. But I've been talking to a lot of people and just asking about it. And retailers are – retailers that I have talked to, so that is not a complete sampling, are pretty universally skeptical and a little bit like, what the heck, man, uh, about it. And um, or, or maybe apprehensive. And why you do know. you think that is? I mean, or what are they telling you the reasons why? Um it varies. It varies quite a bit. So it varies from um, taking – I think a lot of it comes down to they think it, it puts the um, independent tavern at risk. It's um, because there are um, various uh, – you know, there's, there's just different now sets of rules. So what you could do – And uh, when Danielle was on, she said you could essentially open up a bar that's licensed for production, but you could have a five-gallon system. You could have a five-gallon system. Um, That's what somebody said. So someone said you could have a 10-gallon or a five-gallon, and she said, yeah. Just to kind of dispel that as a thing that will drive anyone is that the licensing for having a a brewer's license is going to be be more expensive than it would be to just get a liquor license. So I don't think that this is going to be like a sneak back door that people are going to be like, I'm going to open a bar and serve like cider and beer and like 7% under wine. Uh, and I'm going to go through the whole rigmarole of getting a brewing license. I don't. I, I think that's a non. Do you have to get another brewing license to open a second? Do you have to get a second brewing license to open a second facility? Uh, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Federally, we'll have to get. I mean, for our second location, you'll have to get a. I mean, we still have to get a TTB license. We still have to get our state license. We still have to get our local stuff as well. Um, but at the end of the day, a lot of places don't brew at all. What's I mean? What's so different about a five-gallon system in the corner as opposed to a straight-up barrel aging facility? Like, uh, what's a 
uh, funk factory up in, in yeah. Madison. I mean, wh- why you've always been able to open up a brew pub with a zero in the state of Illinois. Anyway, you've always been able to open up a brewery or brew pub with a zero barrel production minimum. Yeah. And if you had a brew pub, you could sell liquor and wine and spirits and all that kind of stuff. You don't have to serve food through a state right. license. And you don't have to actually make beer. You, you can just, just can't sell your own. You can't self distribute. Right, self-distrust. but it, but in this scenario, like the idea that yeah, I mean, expanding the the it's not as wild west. Well, and I think the think, reason for that being able to self distribute because then we'd be branching over more than one tier. Well, but exp- I think the idea of expanding the uh, abilities of uh, production facilities to serve different things is not going to cause more people to open up faux production facilities to have a a competing bar with some regular bar. There are not advantages that would get want pe- make people want. So to that was do one that. part of it. I don't, I don't, right. So I, don't I think, think that that's a non-starter as like a a thing that this that could happen, but there's no way anyone would actually do it. I don't think anyone's really looking at even the potential ramifications of what's available now. I think they're just more looking so at what what's how how it how it came to be that it was whether they were blindsided or not, whether they were paying attention or not. I think it was just that they felt that they were blindsided, and then it's just the actual competition of you know like. Uh, Roper and Berger said that it was just, you know, uh, breweries that they essentially helped, you know, support along their but way that now are essentially being able to compete against some competitors in the, in the same field. So Yeah, so you know. I, I want to get to that, but there was another side of what the retailers were talking to me about okay. that I want to get sure. out there, which was they the other side of it was that they felt that this was going to be taken advantage of by the biggest players globally. Because anyone can come in and do that. And example being um, um, Ballast Point and Goose is what comes up here because they've both opened up, you know, uh, bars That was before recently. this law. So this law expanding is, is not – does not affect Ballast Point and Goose doing what they're doing. Right. It just opens up the conversation again, though, is what it is doing. Right. Um, sure. But, but those types of breweries were doing that thing already before this law came into place. So if they want to do that, they figure out ways to do it. This law is not going to enable Anheuser Busch to open a million Budweiser tap rooms around uh, uh, the city of Chicago. And honestly, probably half this conversation isn't about necessarily the law that just took place. It's more about what's taking place overall and no, the, and the direction totally. that and the are implications going. of it. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. what I'm saying is that those implications do not change because of this law. Those implications were already in place, in place. prior yep. to this law expanding for breweries that make a, uh, what is ostensibly in the world a small amount of beer. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. That doesn't change the fact that people are definitely going to tap rooms more often than a lot of very supportive bars. So I'm not argue, I'm not stepping over the line of what, what you what you're what you're trying to say. I'm just saying no. that this this law itself. I'm reiterating does not, what people were were telling me was their concern. Right, but th- this law. I think there's a lot of misappropriated concern for this law in that way, in the slippery slope mentality of like, well, if they can do it, then why won't uh, ABI be able to do it? There are because ABI is already doing it, yeah, and they're doing it internationally. Let alone not, and they're doing it here. So this law does not further allow a, a, a multinational conglomerate to do something that they weren't already capable of doing through mm-hmm. their own means. Okay. Um, and then, uh, and anyone kind of jump in, uh, please don't, don't, yeah, wait I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to dominate this conversation. I'm just saying there's a lot of chicken little things happening where like the, the sky is falling. It's like, well, those things that you were worried about, the slippery slope ideas are not part of this law. This law does not make that any more possible, uh, for large breweries to do that. It clearly does make tap rooms a more attractive thing for a consumer. And multiple tap would. rooms and multiple tap rooms, right? right? It's also something right. we see. Across the country. I mean, California, you can have six locations. You can buy outside beer if you serve food. Right. You can also self distro up to a certain extent, too, in some capacity as well. Yeah. Stone's got spots all over the place in the growler fill stations in the bottom of apartment buildings. And uh, brew pubs, obviously, everywhere with all their locations. And if you serve food, you can serve outside beer. I mean, it, this is not the, – the retail component is not crumbling – in those states, I guess, um, you know, I think it's it's different. But also this this building, um, you know, at the risk of alienating a lot of supporting accounts of ours, obviously. But this this building that sneak out, we've been talking about for 18 months. Um, I realize it's a trigger and it's a what's the next step. And it's kind of, you know, I think we're evolving as an industry overall. Where were you guys what, talking about it? Because we found out about it because we saw it. Here on the show, because we saw it on the docket, and then I, someone, yeah. a friend of the show, 
saw it on the docket, reached out to us. I asked Danielle, and Danielle said, yeah. I mean, she didn't pretend that it wasn't going on. Yeah. Right. And then came in and talked about it. But it wasn't um, – it was not out in the public sure. space for whatever reason. I'm not saying it was nefarious that it wasn't, but it's no, certainly it's just not newsworthy when it's the first conversation about no, a law and, we want to maybe. And, you know. and I made a note about it too. Um, someone had mentioned that they had contacted the IRA, which I'm assuming is what the Illinois Restaurant Association. Yeah. So you know, to, to my uh, response to that is, I mean, what how how affiliated are we with the Illinois Restaurant Association, and how affiliated are they with us? <clears throat> I mean, it's not necessarily like the the best demographic in a sense for who we are and where we sell beer to. I know we sell beer to restaurants and stuff like that. I get that, but as a distributor, you mean? No, I mean, just, uh, as, as far as the bill goes, I mean, their response to it was that they had contacted, you know, they had worked with the IRA for this, on this matter, you know, but I'm like, obviously the people from that, my understanding selling outside, I mean, I, I don't know which component of the bill we're talking about, but selling outside beer to, uh, to me, it was, it to was, tap rooms was completely driven by, conversations with ABDI. Um, from my understanding, it was something they were looking at and asked for. Are you, um, as a distributor in Illinois, are you part of ABDI? I'm not, and nor am I a part of the Illinois Brewers Guild either. Like I've, uh, one of the things that we've struggled with is that ABDI we, is the distribution. Associated. Um, beer distributors of Illinois. Beer distributors of Illinois, yeah. And then you have national wholesalers. So again, it's a lobbying. There's group, a lot. So right? like yeah. we've never really been all for uh, we've never been 100% brewers. We've never been 100% distributors. We've never been 100% retailers. So it's like, well, how do we, how do we give them all money, and still have our voice heard as being a very small company? Um, and it's taken a few years for me to realize, like, okay, we probably should pony up the money to be at least, you know, listening to what's going on, and then being at least, hopefully, being able to re, you know, uh, be a, a voice of reason, or at least, you know playing devil's advocate on, on a lot of these subjects. Yeah. But to me, it was just the fact that that was brought up as being the RA was like, well, we contacted them and they didn't have anything. It's like, great. But I mean, what, 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 where are they really at? Like that's, I've been in this, I've been in the business. Though. I've been in like, okay, I, I, uh, I, it's, it's a learning like curve. That, it's been 10 years and I've, I've been 10 years in, in the Chicago industry with it and I've never dealt with the IRA and that might be my, my fault. But um, to me, when you have guys that have been in the business for 10, 20, 30 years and they, this is the first time they're hearing about it. And you're saying that you've contacted the RA. Like to me, I at least would have had these guys at I least in on, on, a, on a panel, or at least it's not uh, a lone l- phone l- call. L- at least that's it- legislators asking for comment. I mean, sure. that's it's 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 a few steps beyond. And that. look, let's just even take what's just happening right now, and let's just let that be a stepping stone to what ends up going on into the future. I'm all about you know rising waters, ra- rising tides. Let's take this as a learning curve to how we do business in the future. Like if we start fighting. You know, we're we're not gonna we're not gonna get that much further. I think we just we need to bring everyone together yeah. at the same table, um, and just just listen to it all, so we can do it the right way and do it a better way. I think that's a, a really great um, uh, sentiment. Uh, honestly, I think if if everyone had been felt like they knew about it or had been at least heard, maybe the, the people would have been. Um, reacted differently who knows maybe it wouldn't maybe it would have been the exact yeah. same if i could distill kind of what i was if i could like rotary distill what i was <laughs> what i've been hearing the, the terpenes of what you've been hearing yeah so <laughs> I, I think and and zach please jump in um i i would say the the retailers feel like uh you know the term i've used here before is uh, the pinch. I think that's the the the, the green flash guy has has, has called it that um, is being felt at uh, many levels, uh, retail uh, in, included, and um, you know tap rooms are very um, popular right now. They're very hot with with beer drinkers. More people are drinking it at tap rooms. There's a connection to the source of creation. There's a whole bunch of really fun stuff going on with that. It's our best marketing tool. Right. And um, and I think retailers feel like they have been very su- supportive of that. Um, and that uh, at and then now uh, it's it's starting to kind of have adverse effects on them their tap rooms are doing well and it's just you know keep they're just pushing for more and more and more which is what a lobbying group should do but as 
uh, you know, Steve Mastney said on when he was on the when we talked about it before, you know, at some point, it's somebody's job to start pushing back. And that doesn't mean that they don't like craft beer uh, or craft brewers. But to to Michael Roper's point, he feels like he has subsidized and continues to subsidize his competition, which is a kind of a uniquely odd space to be in. He's been promoting a lot of these breweries for years and promoting local craft beer for years. And now those are the those tap rooms are literally the places where his customers are going. And his purchasing of those kegs is what is, you know, a drop in the bucket, but you know, enough drops fill a bucket are are what help fund stuff like that. And it's giving him, you know, uh, you know, just cause to kind of just think about that. Not say that I'm going out of business because of this, but just stating right. his case. Think that's where concern. that conversation yeah. is definitely yeah. going. Is it's is is people are looking to see okay who are our friends in the industry and who are our competitors, and I think that's that's what the conversation is heading towards. I think beer started getting a little less friendly a few years back when when shelf space started getting tight. Mm-hmm. And I think, I, I hope it doesn't get more unfriendly now that just the marketplace in general for beer drinkers, you know, on premise is getting tight. Yeah. Um, I think it's the time to pick some really good friends and people who you appreciate and do well and see where that goes. I think. Isn't that always the I, case I, though? Is what always the case? You're going to work and, and show preference and, 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 support your friends the ones you have personal relationships whether that be somebody that has a brewery down the street like michael roper supports metropolitan um to me anyway it seems you're always going to be working with that that avenue and that lens you're gonna want to help out your friends i'm not sure go ahead zach sorry no no i i I don't think there's anything wrong with helping out your friends but when you know if your friend opens a bar across the street from you and you see a downturn in business, I think that friendship is going to have to have a reexamination. I think that's that's where it's like, how bad do you want to have a friend and how much do you want to keep the lights on and pay your employees? It's like people um, say, what was the thing? Like, this isn't show friendship. This is show business. I love business. having friends in business. <laughs> sure. I, love, I love making people I work with my friends, and I am very fortunate to be in the beer industry. I tell people, you know, what better gig could I get than to eat and drink good things and share it with my friends the next day at work? I mean, I'm, I'm very fortunate to do that. And I think a lot of this business is been built on goodwill and good relationships. Obviously, you guys know how important it is to have salespeople that have good personalities that can walk in the door and actually talk to you. And um, I think that's not what it's going to ride on anymore is good personalities and a and a nice smelling salesperson with a smile. I think it's going to be real relationships and and seeing where that goes down the road. Like I said, I mean, I love Salamoth beer and I wish – you guys still brought beer up to my area, but I mean, John, if you moved across the street from me, I don't know if you'd carry Olympic Tavern beer if I was making that, or you know, you'd probably make your own food menu. I mean, that's just business is business, and friends are friends, and I've always been kind of separate about uh, keeping those separate. Sure. Except, I guess, yeah. in the world of beer, where I've made a lot of these people, you know, that I know in the in the biz, my friends. So it's it's just getting, I guess, it's getting weird out there, you know. I have to mention really quick that you're listening to WLPNLP Chicago 105.5 FM Lumpen Radio. This is the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable. I am Chris Quinn, and I am joined by my guest, Zach Rotello, who was just speaking, as well as Brian Kirby of Heartland Beverage Distribution, Mike (laughs) Shalau, and John Barley. So um, we're talking about this new legislation in Illinois, and... uh, uh, Brian, you want to say Yeah, something? so I think, uh, real quick, I think you're seeing a lot of the, the biggest heat coming from uh, bar owners, you know, and I think a, a big reason for that is their brick-and-mortar locations. You know, they're, they're landlocked. Like, they can't take their business and pick it up and move it across the street or into another subdivision. Like, they've, they've planted their roots there. That's where they're established at. Um, you know, uh, breweries, uh, distributors, when a bar closes that we've had a relationship with, yes, it sucks, but you know what? Those people that were going there are now going elsewhere. We can sell our beer to those other locations. You know, it, we might see a little downswing for a little while, but eventually, like, we're still maintaining that same consumer base. These guys have put their roots down here, and now they're seeing, um, 
you know, essentially breweries pop up, um, which is great. You know, they're okay. You can go there and you can sample their beer. You can get a brewery tour. You can learn about them. That's all great. That's fine. We understand that. It's supporting the industry. We're all about it. You know, we, we might carry their beer on, on tap. But now when, when they're able to bring in other breweries' beer, when they're able to bring in cider, and it's just a matter of and time. And they have full-blown kitchens and re- and food programs. Kitchens, and TVs, you know, they got the NFL program. Good stuff. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's them being able to do their business, but you have but to understand. But it's not like, like we wouldn't be able to give a beer with after the tour. It's not like one of those things, sell you a beer after the tour. Yeah, well, I mean, you're, you're much more open to a, a brewery coming in that's doing a tap room only type thing where you can only have those beers there. But when, they, when, they're, when, they're, when that program starts mirroring your program more and more and more, um, it starts to water down essentially kind of what you're doing, and now you're losing consumers to that. When it happens one or, once or twice, so be it. But when you start seeing five or six times and then those people still want you to sell your beer, you know, and, and you're losing on your bottom line, and at some yeah. point you got to... And then that's the other thing I, I, for, I failed to mention before that I've, I've been hearing, like some of the general tones is that, um, you know, uh, tap rooms started out as, as one thing, uh, as a marketing tool. People have fallen in love, uh, suppliers have fallen in love with the, uh, and again, this is what I'm hearing. I'm not saying this is financially true. I don't know the numbers for, for these breweries, but they've fallen in love with the, the margin of these things, and they've become a really good um, uh, cash generator for them. And expanding these only makes that stronger. And, uh, you know, the ABDI or the distribution, distributors actually were in favor from what i've heard of this bill and that was like well yeah because they've been getting cut out of this sweet sweet tap room action and now they can sell distribution because these outside beers these collaboration beers uh, again asterisk can would have to go through distribution now the funny thing is um that's why it was put in there but there's no mention and again this is still but being re- reiterated to me of it being a collaboration thing. It's not like you're allowed to bring in collaboration beers through distribution. It's you can bring in any beer you want well, through so distribution. I would have raised the BS flag on that on that um, stance from the ABDI that they're just opening up this, this un, uncharted territory in a sense. I mean, there weren't breweries that were moving their beer underneath the radar. I mean, some of them were, yes, but it's not like there's some kind of untapped resource that's sitting out there. I didn't. I didn't build my distribution business to be able to sell to breweries. Um, like, okay, how many breweries do we have in Illinois right now, or even within the Chicago metropolitan area, one hundred and fifty to one hundred and eighty? Like, and how many? What percentage of that is actually going to um, take advantage of this? It's. It's a, overall yes, they have a giant buying power. It's probably one of the biggest collective buying powers together, but it's still a very small part of our business. And we're a small company. It's, that would be a small part of our business, let alone a large distribution company that's four or 5,000 accounts. Like right. to me to say that, oh, now we're going to have this untapped thing. So I, I remember when I used to sell Goose Island beer uh, back in 2010, you know, they had tap rooms and they had the production fil- facility. You couldn't go to the production facility and buy a beer there. Like you would go on a tour and then you could drink from there. Then you go to the tap, you know, you go to the brew pubs and you drink the beer there and walk through the line. You know, so now well, some people will say it was stupid. I'm here. Why can't I buy a six pack of Goose IPA? I th- yeah, I think well, that we op- was we, silly. Yeah. We opened our doors <laughs> as a tap room in 2012, and I believe we were the third state licensed tap room in the state of Illinois. Lake Bluff, um, which is a small shop on the north yep. and obviously in the North Shore, and then Revolution beat us by like a couple of weeks when they opened up. You the never forget the facility. <laughs> yeah, and. I, I talk to Josh every day about that. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we're so young. I mean, the, I don't know. I, th- I think this is a I think this is a state that's catching up with a lot of the things that are happening with rock across the country. And an industry in general that's just that's kind of yeah. catching up. That's six years ago. That's, not, that's nothing. nothing. Uh, it, we don't know what, um, you know, one of the things that – with bringing in outside beer, why one reason I'm a proponent is we don't know what it means. Collaboration. I would love to be able to bring collaboration beers. And one thing I think you might have commented on too that I I think is awesome for the Illinois beer community as well is the ability to bring in, um, you know, work out. They're still going to have to get state licensing. They're still going to get have to get temporary or or partial distro or something like that. But our industry friends that don't distribute here, why not? expose 
beer drinkers that are passionate about our products, that are passionate about Pipeworks, yeah. to some of our friends that live across the country. Why not do that through that, retail? That, sure, but well, I, and and you we've absolutely, done that. We've done just, that. I mean, that's a fair question, question for sure. right? But 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 the, the, you can already establish that friendship and convince them to come in and sell just to you. May also, you can I, already do that. It's probably like if you do if we do a collaboration, we did a collaboration with the brewery in New York. And we actually brought it through your distributor, mm-hmm. so we didn't You're have. Talking a, to Brian, so yeah, yeah. so Brian, so I it, maybe it works out better. They're like, oh, we're going to bring it in for full distribution through this distributor. Like other bars and restaurants can have access to it too. It's not just going to be tap room only for. Like, there's nothing in the law saying that has to go that way. But I, I feel like that would be a normal way that this would happen. They wouldn't send two kegs. It wouldn't be worth it for. It wouldn't cause that much of a fuss. For the at least the, the collaboration part of it. Sure. Uh, I also, whatever they whatever they want. Right? I really I mean, don't think well, anyone's crapping on the way that the beer is kind of moving around. I think it's just more so about, like I said, there, it, it's half of like the. It's half. It's half part of the rules being kind of muddied, muddied down to where the. I, I've heard people say that the the playing field's getting leveled, but the playing field's been leveled to a certain extent for a long time. I mean, you have brew pubs that are allowed to make their own beer and sell it there, but then they're also, you know, hindered by the fact that they can't distribute their own beer. Um, and then you obviously have, you know, all the opportunities that are afforded, you know, whether you're a tap room production facility and that type of stuff. But, um, like, to me, like, um, we have very small breweries and they do collaborations a lot. Like, I don't I, I don't make any money by grabbing two six tools from one brewery, bringing it back to the warehouse and delivering it out the next day. Um I love it, and I enjoy doing that, and I like being able to make those connections do things like that. Um, but even on a large scale, it doesn't make a ton of sense. Going back to the Goose Island thing, I remember that they um, they may or may not have been moving their own beer between production and the brew pubs you know, early on in those days, but I remember that something changed to where it had to go through distribution. Um, and then you know, that definitely opened the eyes because there was so much volume that was getting moved across, and there was tax dollars there and who was taxing it. Um, that type of entity, um, and even now I see it between the, you know, the brew pubs that we work with and being able to move volume, um, you know, to other other places outside of that. It's just to to I don't know to if if you were to erode that the three tier system, and I hear that a lot of people kind of complain about it. I don't think they really understand what it means on a grand scale. Yes, as a small as a small brewery, um, you want to be able to self distill. You want to be able to sell your beer wherever. You want to be able to sell you know, packs to go and stuff like that. I get all that. I want you to be but, able to do all that. Just, but you have to understand, to, in my in my opinion, in my in my time in the, in the industry, when you start opening up those doors, there's there's in in my words, there's there's demons that are sitting back there that have access to capital beyond means the, we could even the, understand. This we are we talked about this already. That that, know, are, that is already cap. happening. Know, this law does not make that easier and better for those people that have the the capital and the, that are the demons. So letting the smallest part of the production entity collapse the third tier system a little closer does not mean that in two years it's going to be easier for ABI InBev to do it. Do you, think, they it already goes, do do you that. think it goes more in that direction or further from I that direction? I think it's a moot point because they already are doing it. So before this legislation happened, they were doing it already. So if your idea is that they have enough money – to open tap rooms now, and this law makes it possible yeah, for the brew pub across the street from Wrigley, right? Like that's the old, that's always been the ultimate fear. Um, yeah, but they, they, if they wanted to, they could already yeah, do, they that. do that. Like that, this law does not make it easier for ABI to do that. Like it does not even entail them. They, they it makes does not affect their ability to do that at all. To open up just general brew pubs all over the city and just coat the. Th- this doesn't change their ability to do that. So as I. I have a question, actually. Yes. So, and I want to start with the premise that it would be irresponsible as us as brewery owners and a guild to not advocate for the most robust type of businesses we could operate. Of course. Can we all agree on that? Yeah. Yep. So, no, and that's I like, what I said. I was, and at some point, it's the job of other people to push for back. Sure. Right. It's, but, it's but, how it's supposed to but work. But specifically for uh, Zach and Chris, what would a healthy, good relationship for a brewery to have with a retailer like you look like because it, it, that also has a tap room. What, what would you want that to look like? You want uh, to take it, Zach? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know the perfect answer to that. That's, that's well, like I said, we're all kind of feeling yeah, how, this thing how, out. How far dark. do they have to I be think, away uh, from you, right? Well, just like what would, what, what, would, what would a beneficial, like what can we do to make your businesses thrive? Cause I we, think it's kind I of think like most, yeah. most people that, that are with today. 
Yeah. Something stupid I came up with today was I was thinking, you know, one thing that breweries can supply us with is coasters, T-shirts, swag stuff, all these things. Could a brewery organization do that, even if it was to put, you know, drink Illinois beer on uh, every bar in the city? You know, those are stupid uh, merchandise things that I, you know, that's a simple outreach, I think. I think the Guild has done... Uh, let's put it this way. When I lived in Portland, Oregon, I volunteered for the Oregon Brewers Guild for almost two years trying to get into the beer biz at that point. Um, and all I ever did was go up to bars and bottle shops and grocery stores and hang up posters that said drink Oregon beer. And that was obviously for the consumer. That was for the retailers to show that off. I don't, I don't see any of that in Illinois. I don't know that there's much of a relationship between the retailers and the Brewers Guild. I don't if know. If anything, well, I'd say the Guild has gone. I'll let you speak in a moment, Mike. I'd say if anything, the Guild has gone away from that. It's gone away from general promotion fair, of. Hold on. Oh, sorry. The general promotion of craft beer to a lobbying group sure. and that might be because of who the directors have been the previous director was an events person the current director is a lobbyist sure so that makes sense might be partly my fault too but <laughs> yeah well it's all your fault but i mean but that has been seen uh i mean just today i was talking to somebody who said that you know beer week is dead and that this is going on and that all the guild seems to care about now is legislation and lobbying and i was like well that's probably what makes the most bang for the buck and also but anyway so uh but no you you did not go well i was gonna say i I spent the the i spent the last six years on the uh board of directors for the illinois craft brewers guild one as president um i was also on the uh uh committee that hired our current executive uh, director, Daniel D'Alessandro. And, and, uh, um, you know, our, our viewpoint, uh, at the time, and that's now, man, what is it? Almost two years ago, I think when she came in, um, we saw the future of our challenges as an industry for the Illinois Craft Brewers Guild were hinged upon our ability to be strong and, um, understand and navigate properly the legislative avenue of it yep um so danielle we had worked with for uh quite a while she was our lobbyist prior to that um and bringing her over she's her and katie both are both exceptionally talented people and and um you know we think very good at at pushing our both our agenda and what we're trying to build for illinois craft beer uh forward but you know, you know it's a it's a valid point. It's definitely a different style, I think, than than our previous executive director. And I and um, you know at, at the same time, I think Chicago Craft Beer Week was probably on its way down. I mean, look at our current landscape. It was kind of it was on its way down. That's years a maybe prior singular that. example, but I think yeah. the point being that was uh, a collect that really was all three tiers kind of trying to work in harmony to rise the tide um where now i think some people feel that it's them looking out for you know uh themselves which of course they should yeah. that's what lobbying guilds are for and once they get what they want you then push for the next thing that's what you're supposed to do that's how it's it works in in this country and it's other job maybe some of your business partners like retailers and distributors to start pushing back and when there's enough of a of an outcry then maybe you say well maybe there is going to be some backside uh harm for for some of this and we need to talk about it more so and so what what can us as producers who should be pushing for these rights they they would be irresponsible not to do to help your businesses that's within the letter of the law at least you know we can't like give you part of crazy discounts or anything like that i think we're trying to figure it out too right Right. yeah we we don't want you like no one wants any any great bar or public to perish at all honestly it all starts thrive along with us yeah i want to sell beer top leaf right right, of course and we want to support them want to be as successful it all starts right here with having the conversation in the first place but yeah. I think we need to take a look. Like, when, when you're asking that question, you need to look at the reasons of why you're do, trying to do what you're trying to do. And then look at, op, you know, what who is this possibly going to affect? And let's go talk to 
the top few people kind of in that industry and just get their feeling on it, do a round table on it. Like, hey, this is what we're looking. But, but we think this is going to be good so, for the industry. So this if, is what we want to do. If we had done how, that. How, would, how do you think this may, have, may if, or may not affect your business? So you're saying if, if the Craft Brewers Guild had rounded up Michael Roper and, and, and all these other publicans sure. and they said, we don't want you to do this, you think the, the Craft Brewers Guild shouldn't do that? No, that's, 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 no, that's, I, think that's the, I think the Brewers Guild is doing no. exactly what the Brewers Guild should be doing right. for them. So what, what would but you think suggest that we you can't do something that f- pro know they're going to be upset beforehand? You can't do something pro Brewers Guild and then not take the backlash when other communities jump in and chime in on it like you didn't you didn't like i I think we're trying to take the bash like well i'm asking how can we help benefit your businesses by looking at the potential ramifications of what it is that you're trying to do what you're saying is that we shouldn't do it then that's the only if if i'm going to put a brewery in a a neighborhood i'm going to look at the neighborhood and and see what are the ram like what are the possible ramifications of my business going in there you're obviously looking at traffic you're looking at population density you're looking at incomes you're looking at a lot of things well, look at the other businesses that are like how many retailer accounts are around there, how many breweries are already around there, that type of stuff. I mean, there's there's just it's natural not, not that exact thing, but something similar. And Mike, there's natural like things that are just logical. If a brewery can can sell uh, with a million barrel capacity, Does, could is, sell. is not affected by this law. No, no, to be hold, fair, on, hold so. on. So uh, this is like purely hypothetical like non-realistic in the numbers, but I'm just using it as example. If if they could sell all 1 million barrels direct to the consumer via draft sales, uh, they would and never have a packaging 100%. line, never have distribution, do it all straight out the door. They would. It's the most profitable way. It would be irresponsible to use your for them not to do it. It's just what you... So right. for these tap rooms that have... You know, lucrative revenue sources to grow that is, you know, their quote unquote, you know, fiduciary responsibility to to do that. But at some point, it's also if it starts to impinge or if people believe the retailers that it's impinging upon their business, I mean, that's their responsibility, quote unquote, to say something about it. So I think these are all just natural consequences. Like, what are you supposed to do? I mean, you're supposed to do what's best by you. And at some point, what's best by you might like in the short term might or on the front side, on the back side might have consequences. And it's up to you guys to decide what's best for you. I don't know what you're supposed to do. I mean, this is going to be good for us. It's going to tick off. Uh, I don't want to use hop leaf because I don't want to make Roper no, into no. a bad guy. But as an we'll example. call it bar A, yeah. you know, sure. like like bar A, you know, like what do we do? I like bar A, but you know what? We got to do good by us. And I mean, it, it's just something that I think people are pushing up against now. It's not that bar A doesn't like Pipeworks and it's not that Pipeworks doesn't like bar A. It's just like... These are the things that we just haven't had to talk, talk about, about before. Right. Totally. Yep. Yeah. But if you're well, because like if a new bar opens in your neighborhood and they open up down the street from you, you know they know that they're comp- competition. Breweries, it was never that same level. Right. It's a different lens, it was, right? And and the level is getting if, if the playing field is getting more level, then it's gonna get more crowded. On and that one of level. the things that so, bars were hanging there were well, saying, Well, at least we can curate and serve cider wine and spirits and now curation cider maybe wine are being taken away from them uh as as other reasons for people maybe to go to both maybe to go to a tap room and but, then go to a, uh, i'm just but, saying but this last is what people m- were. but last month i could have opened up a brew pub which had those same rights right yeah nothing so, changed there i could have had i mean again there's no actual food requirement from a state perspective that i have to have to have a brew pub license that allows me to serve wine that allows me to serve booze that allows me to serve guest beer we've been poured you know occasionally when rev would run out of beer they bring guest taps in we've yeah. served our beer at rev our beer and again i don't yeah. i don't think it's that this law is like just the final straw you know that you know it's it's just it's starting to get closer to that the muddying of the waters and so it's just it finally got to the point where the conversation had to come up where the hands went up in the air i don't think that this law necessarily affects anyone right now like too dramatically Whoever's i think we can we can, that we, is we, could they turn it off yeah if possible i don't think it's me that we chime. can we can still all live within the what what this law just did i think it's just there's been enough taking place and there's a direction that it's going in where enough people felt the need to raise their hands 
um, I, I don't feel like this really affects my business at all. Like it's going to take a couple of years before I really understand, you know, the, the scope of it. But at the same time, as you guys are pushing on the brewer side, well, what what happens when we start pushing on the distribution side, where we want to be able to do um, tap rooms and and to go package sales? Like, what if I open up Heartland Beverage across from Pipeworks, and we start? Well, being Pennsylvania's able to, like that, right? Well, yeah, and we'd be able to have draft lines where we sell every single thing that we have available to the market. People can, bars can come there; they can they can buy kegs and package to go. Hey, it's a free market; it's great, okay, but it still cool. craps on your business. It's still kind of you know, even though it may or may not be you know, raising the tide of the industry, right. it's still not best practices overall. And so I just, it, it, it goes both ways in a sense. And, and it's not that I think and, anyone and feels like that this law I'm, is like I'm really... I'm not totally against all this stuff. I'm not even totally against all these rules. Me, me, neither, me neither, me neither. Me neither. And I was trying to ask the question from the perspective of this, this is an, it's happened already and things like this are inevitable. So this is the world we're living in now. So how do we move forward and, and continue to have positive relationships with retailers who have, who now are, are pushing back on the fact that we have these rights? And it's a legitimate question. What would you like to see from the producer who now can have the tap room with the with the cider that is reasonable for them not for them to do? To build on that, I mean, what what I see and where, where I see a second location be even you know to be part of it. I guess part of the conversation is having multiple locations, right? But like, you know, I see a, a world in which not only do I compete with Pipeworks on a regular basis for tap handles everywhere, right? Um, we compete with. Uh, regional and national breweries that do have the resources that have three, four, five, six locations, um, each of a multi-million dollar generators for them to be able to have the cash flow to compete. I want to add a point to that. Here, here, here in Chicago land, but, but also, you know, and I, unfortunately I think this is also a world in which craft beer and how it's developed over the last six years that, both we and certainly Pipeworks built is like we're doing one-off stuff all the time. So now retail accounts are a rotating world from us. You know, we don't have self-distribution margin the same way that Pipeworks does. We do a hundred percent of our beer through distribution. Uh, we've invested into salespeople to offset that and establish the relationships to what Brian was talking about. And, and, you know, it's more expensive for us to operate, to sell even, you know, from a from a ratio perspective, it's more expensive for us to operate than last year and the year before that and the year before that. And I guarantee it's probably the same way at the yep. self distro level. In the last exponentially, so. yeah, the last three or four years particularly um, have been you know we're getting a lot uh, less C you know from a from a distro language standpoint we're getting a lot less CES from our investment into a market, even it being our home market, even with us growing exponentially mm-hmm. within that time frame. Um, you know, for me, if I'm going to invest a few hundred thousand dollars in opening a second location versus hiring two or three more people, I'm going to get a better return to what you're yeah, talking about location, as a business. Yeah. And the other two, uh, to kind of, I think, bolster your point, uh, is, you know, retailers have been, um, loyal to, you know, uh, to, to put it kind of, not fairly, but and maybe overly bluntly, you know, they've been loyal to the dollar of craft beer, meaning they believe in craft beer and they want to sell craft beer to consumers. They haven't been loyal necessarily to individual breweries. I mean, we're no. in the era of the rotating draft handle. So it's not like um, that people sell on eBay. But yeah, right. No, but <laughs> right. so it's like, but, but, you I say know, to that, but too. you know what? Yeah. I, I, right, right. To that, but it's man. not like, it's not like we're, these retailers are saying like, you know, hey, uh, local brewery A, B, C, and D, you're literally my constant handles, and now you've all opened up across the street from me. I mean, the the retailers have gone into a whirlwind of of rotation, and you know, even the beer temple when we started, like there was several uh, uh, steady breweries that I was trying to keep on. And you know, honestly, it's it's hard to do sometimes, but yeah. we're still trying to do it. Right. And um, and that was me trying to push back on this rotation, this whirlwind rotation um, mentality. But it's not like the retailers have been the best friend of any individual brewer either, and they're looking out for them, and the brewers have to look out for them too. And sometimes it comes at you know they come to odds, and what do they do, Mike? I think maybe you have to realize. The realities of, of the situation and that some of these people are feeling, you know, f- 
I mean, there's I, a little bit of fear. There's a little bit of fear in Michael Roper's. There's no long-term relationships anymore. Yeah. Uh, there's no long-term relationships. I didn't say I, no. I don't know that I agree with that. I didn't say no. None. Ooh. I'm saying it. The industry, the retail industry, the craft bar has moved away from it. There is no doubt sure. that that has happened. Sure. Well, yeah, so, and just, I, I, don't, I don't. I didn't mean to make that point either. From a long-term relationship, there's still. I mean, we have long-standing. No, this was my no, point, but I was that adding on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was not. I don't want to put those I, words into your mouth. John. I want to make sure that what I said is not painted as you hate com- combative. Retailers. No, yeah, you? It's, it's black and white. <laughs> it's because, black and white. Because, because yeah, yeah, clearly I hate retailers. Uh, but <laughs> no, because this law now exists on the record. It is more cutting that out, and that will be. Yeah. And thank you. I also uh, hate, goodbye. I hate distributors. I hate malt suppliers. I hate hop suppliers. I hate yeah. uh, all of them. Weed uh, beer. That's the future. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> hoppy, hoppy water. But, but now that these things, like, it is more important that we actually like pay attention to these relationships we have with, with uh, retailers and distributors. Uh, I'm saying this is actually m- makes us have to focus on that more. So I want to. That, I just want to know what would it look like for you guys to feel like this this is a mutual relationship or that you're benefiting as much as we are that's all i was saying it was not trying to be combative and i uh, i hope it didn't come across that way it didn't i just wanted to add one thing on when john's uh, uh point um across illinois brewers and then breweries from outside of illinois so like i i i pulled my 401k i pulled my savings i pulled every penny i had i went into debt as far as i possibly could to start this company because i believed in bringing good beer to to good people and i still believe that ethos beverage so the beverage right so like <laughs> honestly like the the more things uh become available for illinois breweries uh whether you know they can open up more tap rooms they can have a production facility and sell it to their to their tap rooms i.e., you know, call it bars if you want, uh, the more self-distro that they can do. I want to sell Illinois beer. I really do. I want to keep it close. I want to keep it local. I want to have fun with it, keep it fresh, all that stuff. It's cheaper for me to move it around. The more that that gets, um, I hate to say muddied or whatever it is, but the more that that gets taken away from me or, or, or separates from me, I'm not going to turn in my license um, anytime soon. So I'm going to go and look for breweries outside of Illinois and start bringing in stuff from the Midwest, stuff from Retailers the Retailers are saying the same thing. Right. So I, I love I, – I enjoy your ability to, to do what you want to do on your own terms. But just know that with you know anything comes – not necessarily ramifications, but just you know give me a word. Uh, not repercussions, but just you – know, Green dragon. Green dragon, man. So um, – you can't you can't be upset about us bringing in more brands and, and more brands being available that are coming in from outside when you know we're when we don't have access when we want to work with you guys and and you know you're saying no we can do it ourselves better and that's fine that's your own thing but just don't be um, and I'm not I'm not is that what we're saying not, though yeah I mean no, from, I'm if not I looking, open no, up another location no I just wanted to raise or my three hand. which we can I just I want I just wanted to make the point that um, the more that. Illinois breweries can do on their own, and I'm saying that that's not a bad thing. You can do that, but just know that, like, these distributors that are here, they're not going to go anywhere. They're going to go and grab brands, and they're going to bring them here to sell them. So you're going to end up competing with more overall versus working just with a is. And the other thing that, that I, the I remember that people you. saying is, you know, uh, maybe it was like a year or two. It was fairly recent or maybe even three years ago was, uh, man, uh, that, that brewers were saying was – um, oh, there's so many breweries already. If you really want to get in the beer game, distribution. That's what you should be opening. Opening a craft distribution house. But now the tap rooms are taking, you know, the you know, these little guys, you know, that's that's bread and butter, meat and potatoes. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about. Uh, so so hungry. it's uh, um, uh, – so, again, it's like looking out for them because that is something that I heard a lot of craft uh, – supply side people saying is you know the the market's getting overcrowded already we need distribution outlets and now you know a small local dis- distributor who now has less to distribute because more of it's getting going through a tap room is you know it's it's hurting that viability and then they will have to go to like brian just said uh outside um uh, suppliers um, and, and from a retail standpoint, you know, that's what I think, um, you know, Michael Roper, again, we keep using him as an example, but he's been very vocal about it. And I think mm-hmm. it's, it's and publicly vocal about it. So I think it's it's OK, okay to use him uh, as an example for what many people are, are, are have been doing is is doing more 
uh, out of market and maybe even out of country and import um, and even out of category stuff. And now that... Um, well, it's cyclical, right? I mean, that's the 90s. Yeah. That is yeah, the 90s. For sure. Zach, I got a question. If Pipeworks or Solomoth were to open up a spot in Rockford or in your general vicinity, how far away do we need to be for it to be considered competition? I don't know. I mean, when you, I, if you want to think about all on-premise places as competition, is you know, is the Buffalo Wild Wings across town from me competition? Sure. I mean, right. Um, no, I mean, and plus, you know, there's a balance there, though, Chicago, right? I mean, Chicago is density of population where you can walk block on block, and there's bars with lines out the door. Sure. You know, not the rest of the state is like that. You know, you get a drive a couple blocks and I, I, I don't know. I, there's no hard lines, like I said, and I don't know what like the great feedback from the, the craft brewers guild looks like other than, um, you know, I feel like a lot of the interactions that retailers have had with the craft brewers guild have been more like restrictive well, to I, say, no, Jack, you can't. I was asking about that, as producers, then. not through the guild as us as like, right. we sell you yeah, beer. We had, we're, we're going to have a tap room at some point. Uh, what can we do as a producer to make this a healthy relationship? And it's a fair question, especially for you and me, Mike, because your place is literally down the well, street, literally I, down I, the street I, yeah. from me. If, yeah. if it was my business, I would take a look at my account list and I would pick a couple from the top twenty-five, a couple from the second twenty-five, the third twenty-five, and the bottom twenty-five, and and have conversations with them about, you know, off record what you're trying to do and and what their thoughts are on it and how they think it may affect or not affect their business. I think we definitely should, as a as an industry, um, probably try and put something together that's kind of off of the guild record, off of an industry association record, and where we can just get together and talk about things like this in a yeah. roundtable. But uh, well, Kirby, what would be your thoughts if we mirrored California, where brewers could bring in outside brands and distribute them? Modern Times does that down in San Diego. Yeah, so it definitely muddies up what I'm what I'm doing, and so it, sure. I'm definitely hearing something different than I have been, but um, I mean that's that's totally like anti three tier. I mean that's it's it's not three tier. So right? what what would afford you the right to do that? That it's it wouldn't empty. afford. The, okay, so let's just say that obviously if you can do that, then everyone else can do that. So once you open up that door, now you can say Budweiser can come in and they can distribute their own brands. Right? Again, they do well, this stuff already. Welcome to L nine. What does right? what does Budweiser distribute in Illinois? You don't think that they the Reyes group is like they they own distributors across the country, only a, yes, but yeah, they some. still yeah. there's still layers to it. Even I'm, I'm talking and Illinois, less and less after the DOJ and, and, came through and yeah, still Illinois did, less. Uh, they also still less, dictate, they, can't get they more. still dictate the behavior of many distributors. That if you're sheer right, nature but of they how are invested in several Illinois houses across the country. Would we all agree across with that? the country? I think, yeah. different. I think Kirby is kind of getting at the fact that you know, ten years ago, brewers were saying. You know, hey, we gotta we gotta change these laws because AB can. They're gonna change the laws and make it so that they can have distributors and tied house of pubs and all these places. And fast yeah. forward ten years later, I think and saying it's already trying to go back the other way is not a fair thing. And that the idea that that Constellation, Budweiser, and Miller Coors wouldn't be heavily subsidizing retailers and saying like, we'll pay your liquor license costs, we'll pay half we'll your pay rent, everything. we'll pay half of this, we'll pay half your that. If you sign on the dotted line, you don't even have to you... sign, man. Oh wait, uh, no, but I mean that—that's the deal. I mean, if you legally could and sign it contractually, you know, they would. Sure, okay. they would. I'm not, I'm not arguing that point at all. Me. There's not much brewers yeah. can offer you legally under the law. You know, John, you can't even offer me coasters. You can't offer but me. And my point is saying is, they already do. They're, they're, they're fixing some of that. True. But this law doesn't that affect that their ability to do that. So I think that is a boogeyman we're not, argument. We're that, not saying that, that about that law. No, no. I'm just saying there's already a lot of restrictions on what we can and can't do in this industry. He's and talking about a lot of people things. are just feeling out what the rules and are. I'm just saying one, one, once you open that door, you open up Pandora's box. One, that's not true. One perspective of this argument that we haven't talked about at all yet is the customer perspective. I think it's great for the customer, honestly. Do they care? No. I don't think they do. No, they don't. And And – I mean, is yeah. it, it's also to me, anyway, is it a is it a generational question too? And we have, uh, you know, an evolving business, obviously, and especially over the last six, seven years from a craft beer perspective in Illinois. Um, but you know, I don't know what this is going to look like in ten years. 
I don't think any yeah. of us do. I think the more that we can offer to the and consumer, the better. And just let him, let him, if you don't I mind. Yeah. Dying, so. No, no, no. I, yeah, I, and, and and I pretty much was. But, you know, consumers don't care. What are we? Maybe they're, no, maybe it's not even that they don't care. They don't know maybe they're but Maybe they're glad that they can finally get a, a cider at the brew pub or that they can get right. another brewery as well. Or that, you know, I go to uh, Metropolitan and they never have anything other than lagers or something like that. And maybe now that they can, you know, maybe the, <laughs> the, like that is good for consumers that they can do it. That Metro can put an IPA on without ciders. having to brew one. Yeah. And I don't think it's, I, I don't think, and you, know, you guys don't have a, tap room per se at least yet but like i mean i don't think it's gonna like all of a sudden kick the door it's not gonna be tomorrow there's everybody's got 17 draft handles that are not manufactured on site i will bet i'll make a bet can i put in a bet now that within a year from right now that i'll take 10 city uh tap rooms and i will count how many non uh produced beers they percentage there but no, no, just a straight up number, and how many are collaborations, and how many are guest taps, you have to and randomly the guest select, taps will be. You have I to would, randomly select the breweries though before you do that. Yeah, I, yes. there'll be there'll be, be way more guest 10. taps. It'll be less than ten percent at at most. My point, but, but there's also look at sorry, but it's sorry, not sorry. a collaboration. It's not a law to get collaborations in there. It's going to be guest taps. Guest taps is what it's going to be. It's going to be our friends, and I think it's probably often going to be kind of exclusive stuff is what i think it's going to be stuff you can't get anywhere else you have to come to our place yeah. to get this stuff and you can't get it as a retailer technically else. why is that bad technically that this is also something I'm just that, saying, that also exists. look at mouse it strengthens trap. you guys a lot and it weakens a but retailer look at, look but, at something but, like but you have that right now if you if you established a f- friend if you established established a relationship with a brewery in San Diego or a brewery yeah. overseas yeah. and you convinced those guys yeah. to distribute right. in Chicago and right. sign with your uh, right with sure. Brian and to and, send and them exclusively kegs and, and, and to send them kegs too. You, you can do that right now. I can't yes, send them but kegs. If I, you, but you if have what do you mean? A beer on tap right now at your tap that you what went you mean, to send Sierra them? Nevada and brewed. That is like what do you, you mean? Did send that. them kegs. That is a collaboration. There are there's, like the there's, there's laws in place for three tier. Where if another account asks for that beer, we have to be able to offer them that beer. We can't we can't solely just pick the accounts we want to sell beer to. So there's already things laws in place that that disallow that. First of all, which are protections in the three tier system? Allocations do not exist in this state. Allocations <laughs> is a different thing, but we can't solely just bring in a, one beer for one account. If if no account asks for it, so be it. But if an account asks us for that beer, we by law have to be able to offer that beer unless we have a reason to not sell it to them. So you want me to tell you what your reason is going to be? Is because oh, we don't have enough. No, not even that. He do, they don't have to bring it in through your whole distribution network. We can pick a one city block, and it happens to be Chris's street for district, I suppose. Yeah, right. Yeah. And now, if if the Seven Eleven that's on the corner that happens to share a location in, within that block, if they want it, they can also buy it. They but could also come in and get a. Couldn't they come in and get a self distro license in this state? They can. Uh, I don't know yeah. the out of state shippers. Probably not license. out of the United States, but they definitely can out of state. Out of state. Sure. So a, a California years, California and, brewery, and if they wanted to set up a guest handle at a at the new Pipeworks spot down the street, I could do that. And then they distribute their own stuff. One tangent that I had on a note. Um, so when a uh, brewery sells their beer to another brewery, can that brewery that is already filling growlers of their own beer then sell growlers of that beer that's being purchased? That's a good question. Other people have asked that, that, would that be too. A good way I for would a brewery guess that... no. I'm guessing Zach doesn't care at all. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. I, I, have, Zach I have no interest. Zach's, I think there's, <laughs> Zach's gonna start growlers. selling growlers. I think that there's um, one thing about growlers. I think is worth bringing up in a moment, but I I do. Um, want to respond because I think you make a very fair you you ask a very fair question which is you can establish those relationships too and bring them in but there is definitely um you know there is just definitely different relationships between brewers one than between brewers I mean, and distributors they and take brewery trips to Germany and establish direct brewery relationships and yeah. they bring in one-off stuff that is only available and there. That's been going on exists. for hundreds of years. We're yeah. not yeah. talking about that. I mean, yeah. yes, you can do this, you can do that. Yeah. Um, what was the final part of that? Sorry. Uh, but, I mean, I, I – and I think we – um, e- We have an easier ability to establish that relationship? Was that? Well, I just think that that's one part of it, and, and that is just the nature of it. I don't think we should make that illegal. The other thing is you also have the ability to set up um, – uh, 
<laughs> this is the word that came to mind, and it's got such a terrible uh, 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 connotation with it, but almost like cartels uh, where you could have, like, um, pick, like, okay, let's say, like, Trillium, other half, and um, we'll do one down in the south, Jester King. Sure. Um, so you could just say, so, okay, at Salamoth, we're going to do Trillium, other half, Jester King, Salamoth. Jester King's going to do Solomoth, other half, and Trillium. And Trillium's going to do Jester King, other half, and Solomoth. I mean, that could easily happen where it's just like, we're just going to do a little tip for tat. We're going to send you stuff. And you're, I'm thinking on the fly, but sure. that is a difference that a retailer couldn't do. Be like, we're going to give you our big bad barrel age stuff that you can do. You give you us our big badge barrel age stuff. We're friends genuinely. I'm not saying that like right. you're our, you know, you're going to sign the dotted line that we're friends now. It's like, no, you are friends. You hang out. You go to beer fest. You pour next to each other. You got wasted beers after. together or whatever. Yeah, you got wasted after the event that one night and now you're, you know, you're, you're gen- genuinely friends and you guys love beer genuinely because you're brewers. So, it, it's it's like no it, that will it's happen. An, it's natural. It will happen. I think in a year there will be more guest handles that are um, exclusive or almost entirely exclusive than there will be collaboration handles. That's just my prediction, and that's not what the law says it was intended to do and pitched as. Which I think is the my BS meter kind of like started going into the red when I heard it was for collaboration. So I just don't personally believe it, and I could be wrong. I have some breweries that are kind of maxed out in capacity right now. It's not a lot of capacity, but they're maxed out, and I wish they would bring in guest taps because they're feeding draft lines off of fermentation vessels in a sense. So I'd rather free up those fermentation vessels for Mm -hmm. beer that we can sell. And I get to get good margins off of it, but they'll make a lot more by me taking that fermentation tank out of the building right away. Um, Yeah. The last thing I wanted to say is, uh, you know, I think there are some fair – there's some fair pushback from suppliers saying that retailers are being, you know, protectionist here and to hold things as they were because it was better for you then. And that's why you want it, which, again, you know, everyone's looking out for themselves and trying to work within a system that's um, sustainable but beneficial to everybody. And Mr. Rotello, I thought, had the best re- retort um, to that with his uh, love for growler fills, which is, you know— Call, it, it's kind of the co- pot calling the kettle black where, Don't have time. you know, calling somebody, you know, kind of protectionist there while at the same time saying that growler fills should only be done at a supply side does go to say, like, um, you know, in, in every situation, people are going to do what's best for them. You can say whatever you want to me about the Ill- uh, the guild's reason for having growler fills only at supply side and for sanitation and stuff like that but it it was an exclusive reason to go to a brewery i mean because you could only get certain stuff at a in a growler there and they wanted to protect that because they needed that revenue and i was a and i argued with zach that i thought this was a good thing to kind of strengthen breweries and get that high profitability going and get the beer out there was with this growler law and i don't care about growlers i don't like growlers but th- I personally believe that that's why they wanted exclusive right to fill growlers. So everyone does this. Everyone's looking out for themselves. And, Zach, you can talk to your point, too, that you had mentioned where they were talking about a quality issue, I think it was. And then they came back that it was that they wanted to hold on to that. Why, like, why, why offer up that exclusivity, I right? thought I didn't have to talk about growlers today. <laughs> oh, no, we are going to let you got like not 10 talk. minutes, though, so we got to No, no. Come okay, on. so, you know. Um, we'll just cut to that I, best of clip. I don't care about growlers. Years. I don't Remember want to that time. Anymore. I think <laughs> it went a little well, something. Like this. It went a little something like this. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, I, I think it's more the idea that when, when the question was asked, like, hey, can we do this, too? And the answer was no, but we're going to do it. That's not like level footing, and I, I mean, hey, I'd love to be able to shuffle product from uh, my place to a warehouse when I can get a 250 case deal on house wine, but I can't do that under my liquor license. You know, now now breweries can do that. Um, again, I think we're we're navigating this complicated three tier, very restrictive system that I I wouldn't have if the Buffalo Wing guy wanted to open up a Buffalo Wing store next door to me. I mean, this this is just finding out where we are in the channels that are changing right now and trying to navigate that. Um, 
Yeah. So so when it came to growlers, Man. yeah, I think Man. the restriction it was more of a let's let's restrict this and let's do this, and we want to celebrate the differences in our in our liquor laws. You know, your liquor law says you can do that. My liquor license says I can do this, and if we all could do the same thing, we'd be a lot less interesting. I think that was Gabe from from Half Acre that was kind of rebutting my question about growlers at the time, yeah. and now now the quote is. Well, now we want to be able to do a little bit of everything. Yeah, so and it, it's funny. Where are we at, and where where's you know where are we going? It, it's interesting. As you were saying something, I I thought of uh, you know uh, you can't warehouse you know a pallet drop or a ten pallet drop of 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 Budweiser or whatever it is where you could get it you know really really cheap. And again, those deals are available to everybody. But if only Benny's has enough space to take it, that's not our fault, you know, which is how a lot of that stuff goes, which is, you know, that's how the law is written. Um, and maybe it's it's the fact that my father is an attorney and, and <laughs> kind of taught me, you know, when you're looking at something, look how it can be gamed because right. that's just how it's going to happen. And it Couldn't and you warehouse would, offsite? No. So no, we can't do that. No. So but the, the issue is sure. and this is not yet. Yeah, definitely. Separate sure. license for it. Yeah. Um, so well, you'd have to have it the license, but right. Oh yeah, you can. As yes, a retailer, open up another retailer for your but, And bag. you can't. But well, that's like what two grand a year. I mean, but you no, you can't move back and forth between mm-hmm. those. You can maybe. No, you can't. So anyway, that's something it, the ILCC checks. Oh, you can do a, you like a one-time transfer. They make sure it's, it's shipped not, to your location. That's not something strategic. Yeah. Um, so like, hmm. Binnie's cannot have a centrally located warehouse that they distribute Otherwise, they out would for sure and have much smaller retail locations. Exactly, but. But the the it's interesting. I don't think this is going to happen. But uh, <laughs> but now could a brewery with a warehouse could they buy ten pallets of Bud Light and then move it there and get it at the cheaper yep. price than goes, a small if spot? If it's meant to go through distributor, they have to go through distributor. If it's self distro, they can do self distro. And then they can move it. Long. And then they yeah. can part move of this it. license too was or part of this uh, bill was interesting off site warehousing. Yeah. I think everything so they did in the bill So it's interesting, like these little sense. things you don't think about. For you them. did. Well, well done, Derek. I mean, I brought it up. I, I, I actually read the law. I actually yeah. read it. Yeah. So did you uh, did you see anything about them being able to pour growlers of uh, guest beers? I, I didn't see anything that wrote that in there, but I also I don't, don't think see so. anything. In, there's that nothing in the Illinois it. Liquor Code that says anything about growlers or draft beer to go whatsoever. So, so do it, man. I don't want to do it. I have no interest <laughs> in doing it. Right. I really have no. no I'm just talking about it. breweries being able to do it. I mean, it's just no. I don't. I I I assume, and in, in my interpretation would be what we've discussed anyway with retailers, where we can't repackage it. I mean, that would I would I, assu- I would assume that we're the same in our tap rooms. That you can't. Correct. You can okay. Yeah, I, I would assume we'll be able to buy packaged product. We'll be able to buy draft product, but I would assume we would. You not can't re. Repackage I would, it. And yeah, sell. I would assume we would follow the same standard. But you could probably sell a, a you could whether, sell a keg of it though, right? Sure. You could buy a case and sell a six pack if you could if you had a to go license. Yeah, yeah, of course. And you could sell a keg just like you sell your kegs right. normally. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it could be. Yeah, I mean, there's. Uh, think of the ramification ramifications of that. Is yeah. You could have exclusive. Uh, six pack deals. You could have one time pop up. So you know you could do a whole bunch of stuff. But whatever. I mean, and that, and that might sting my business or my perspective in a sense. But really, I mean, if that's if that's your business model, oh, and you think sure. that's the best thing for you, then go for that. Go for it. You know, like, sure. At some point, you know, you're probably going to need us. But and I don't want you to think that uh, anyone we out need there you now. to yeah. think that you know the hop leaf or, or the beer temple is going to go out of business because you know the the triple dry hopped once a year. Um, beer from whatever yeah. brewery is now has you know we're doing like a pop up release also at the new Solemn Oath place. That's not that's not the case, but it is interesting how you're seeing you know whether it's leveling or now over leveling or whatever it's changing. And I think people even right now we're all just coming up with well, could you do this? Could you do that? Yeah, I think you probably could. And people are going to think of ways to use it to their advantage as they should. And in a year, it'll be interesting to see how this law is being taken advantage of. And I guarantee you, it's not just, um, well, uh, you know, the cider thing, I think, is kind of personally... Mute? No, I mean, I just think, like... It's weird. It's weird. I think it's, you just want to have... A you just want to be a bar. I think it would have been better if it was written gluten-free. But you're a bar. Cider, but... I also want to like make say, a gluten-free de- beer to defend us for a second. The people that are 
defend, most likely defend who? producers. Okay. People that are most likely to do their best efforts to try to keep places like the Beer Temple and like Hopleaf uh, like vibrant and healthy are the ones who are also going to benefit from this the most. Like, so the people who are going to put the effort in are going to be the ones who also want those places to be strong. Right. So uh, you, there will be people who will game those things, but those aren't probably going to draw from the same consumer base that you are happily for the people who are going to be could be potentially be hurt the most by it. Are they not going to be the same people? If someone's just coming in slick and not caring about retail at all, they're not going to be a very healthy business. So there's a lot of things you can definitely game and do, and so there will be a couple people who do that. But it, I don't think it's going to be that overlapping with the people who really care about craft beer that, on the consumer side or the producer side, and both of those places want places that have supported craft beer for a long time to be very healthy. If, so, this, if this is a law that adds 5 or 7%, I don't think it will, but if it added 5 or 7% to our bottom line and we bring that across two locations like what we're trying to do, um, I'm going to invest that right back into people. It's not like I'm going to go buy jet skis with it. Yeah, for sure. Like well, I'm going to invest it right back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I'm going to buy the hop leaf and then tear it down. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, I think that's, that's no, no, no. I'm going to invest though, people to better service our our retail partners. I'm going to we're going to put right. that. We 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 have no ambition to at any time in the even relatively near future to do anything except continue to invest in our right. own business. Hundred percent. If it's and closing your accounts, if you doing this is closing your accounts, you're going to stop. Nobody at, for nobody us. at this right. table that's is making yeah. Yeah. real money off of selling beer, like. We come here on a Thursday night at eight o'clock for two hours to speak about it. Because <laughs> well, Chris we care pays about us it. so well. Yeah. Right. Wait, what? Yeah, because it pays so well. <laughs> Check keeps Guys, I told you. <laughs> Project Green Dragon is not known <laughs> to everyone in the room. Uh, it's time for us to wrap things up. I wanted to thank everyone for coming on. Uh, Zach Rotello, Brian Kirby, um, Mr. Uh, Dust, and <laughs> John Barley. Um, My parents are so proud. Final, final <laughs> words for anyone, Zach. Anything you want to say in, before we yeah, get out? Yeah, I don't want to mischaracterize. You know, a lot of this conversation is just stuff that we're all having to to figure out as the industry changes. And I, I don't want there to be any ill will. I, I don't want it to be perceived as that. So I mean, I just I, I love you guys. I love all you guys. <laughs> yeah, and we're and Salmo's not talking about coming to Rockford, but I was asking for pipe work, So <laughs> we're in Rockford. We're at Olympic no, Tavern. No, no, I meant opening a spot. I was just oh. joking. I saw you in Copenhagen when I was there. I saw Pipeworks. <laughs> That's right. We are in Copenhagen. Nice. There are a lot of super high-end American breweries on draft in Copenhagen. Like super stuff that you end. would like never. Super, Is that a division of like a... Not super high-end. Supreme Super hipster. like, uh, um, you know people stand in line hyped. at and hyped and stuff like that that you can't get well, anywhere in the states that you see on draft there it was kind of yep as a powerful force it's, just, it's almost as if those retailers have direct relationships with those breweries or something it's like, like chicago, that also chicago, eight, funny. Yeah. chicago eight years ago <laughs> brian anything you want to say um yeah no calls, it might be no calls. it might be 18 months before you're on again <laughs> it will not be i promise you We're, we'll have a 24 um, months. So yeah, well, we're going to turn five years old in December, so oh, we're working on some uh, some kind of shenanigans for a big party with some music and food and beers just to bring out our friends, family, retailers, customers, suppliers that have helped get us to this level. But uh, it's tough for any business to succeed you know, for a few years, let alone five, and uh, we're not going away anytime soon, so we just want to kind of give back and have some fun. So That's awesome. Stay tuned. Um uh, support your local bar that has been supporting craft beer. There you go. Peace. You uh, you want to just laugh at that. I actually mean that. Also, your distributor. Support your distributor, whatever, however you do that. So you're just saying that's self interest right there. You are your distributor. You son of a. Uh, John, any <laughs> smart man. Um, I'm proud to be a part of this community here in Chicago from retail all the way through the distributors that we have here to. to uh, suppliers and the producers and what we're trying to do. I think this is an awesome time to be a part of this, obviously nationally, but I mean, we're in a pretty rad market that's doing some super interesting stuff on a global scale. That's, you know, a privilege for us to be able to sit here and argue and hang out with friends and, and chat about it. So, you know, we're proud to be a part of it. Awesome. Serge. Uh, yeah. Serge, anything you want to say now? Serge. Remember, <laughs> surge is not a lot. Surge is I've not. I've been sitting next to a surge protector all night long. And it's just like, how <laughs> ironic is it, or metaphorically speaking, that he's the protector and his name is Surge. There so. you are. 
Um, <laughs> what, very deep, deep. I'll let you guys think about that for that's a whole that's week. Some green dragon stuff, right? Yeah, there. right. You don't know about <laughs> the your green senior dragon. fingers thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got to get out of here. Thank you again so much to my guests, uh, Zach, um, Brian from uh, Heartland um, Beverage LLC, and uh, Mike Shalau and. John Barley. I'll see you again in a week for more of the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable. So long. Remember this is what we wanted. Remember this is what we said. To never be heard and seen from again, 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 again. Remember this is what we wanted. Remember this is what we said. To never be heard and seen from again, 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 again. Remember this is what we wanted. Remember this is what we said To never be heard, seen from again, again, again